Hello, my name is Wendy Myers. Welcome to the Live to 110 podcast. You can find me at live to 110.com and learn more about my healing and detox program at mineralpower.com. You can also find this video podcast on my YouTube channel, Wendy Live to 110, if you prefer to watch the video. Today we're interviewing Tyson James Lee, also known as The Action Boss. You can find him at theactionboss.com. We're going to be talking about food associations and how to break negative food associations. There's many people out there today, I know many of you listening, are caught up in the grips of food addictions, binge eating, overeating, uh, difficulty losing weight, or gaining weight, and Many people today feel like they're spiraling out of control and they don't know how to break out of the grips of food addiction. I've definitely been there myself and uh, really have gotten a lot of help and done a lot of research uh, myself on this. And so I thought Tyson would be one of the perfect people to come on the show to talk about all the tips and tricks he uses with his client base in his Thai Fit program on how to break the negative associations and, and break free of those chains. Please keep in mind that this program is not intended to diagnose or treat any disease or health condition and is not a substitute for professional medical advice. The Live to 110 podcast is solely informational in nature, so please consult your healthcare practitioner before engaging in any treatment or anything that we talk about today on the show. Tyson James Lee has been training clients uh, for over seven years and has his bachelor's degree in sports medicine. Uh, the, last year, he launched his company called TyFit and is now one of the highest paid online trainers in the world. TyFit is a company built on delivering the truth to the world about nutrition and fitness. The goal is to have a direct impact on the obesity epidemic in America. TyFit teach, teaches weight loss, muscle gain, injury recovery, anti-aging, and ultimately human performance. Tyson spends countless hours researching and trying the most effective ways to achieve your ultimate body and healthy body. And cli Tyson's clients lose an average of 30 pounds in 8 to 12 weeks. And he's even had more spectacular results than that. It's really amazing. Uh, Tyson has overcome several career and life-threatening injuries from a strep A blood infection that left him crippled to blowing out three discs in his back. Each time being forced to discover more effective ways to teach peak, uh, to achieve peak performance without putting severe stress on the body. After each injury, Tyson has come back bigger, stronger, and faster, only gaining a wealth of knowledge in the process. And it's fair to say that Tyson defied all the odds to get where he is today. Due to his passion for helping the world, he has taken his life's knowledge online in his program, TyFit, in the hopes to have a greater impact that stretches across the globe. Tyson, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me, Wendy. Love it. Love it to be here. So why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and why they call you the action boss? They call me the action boss because I take a lot, a lot of action. And I uh, took a lot of uh, misinformed action, just action, 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 action. And I ended up taking enough of it over my life uh, to create some success. So I often tell people uh, for 28 years, Tyson tried to get his stuff together, tried to do this business, tried to do that business, tried to go to school, tried for success. And Tyson just couldn't figure it out. So it's like uh, me, myself, and Irene. So one day I woke up and I birthed the action boss. And the action boss dominates business, dominates life, dominates relationships, dominates his industry, uh, pretty much dominates everything. So the action boss is the alter ego uh, kind of to to Tyson. And that's what I created. Uh, and the action boss is awesome. I look up to him. Uh, I would you know, love to meet him one day. It would be really, really remarkable. <laughs> um, so a little bit about me is uh, 20 months ago, I was uh, really miserable in life. Uh, you know, make a long story short, uh, I took $600 in a backpack uh, from Washington State down to San Diego, California. Uh, started training in a couple gyms, sleeping on couches, renting rooms. I uh, even slept on the beach for a couple weeks. So um, basically, I went from being homeless to being one of the higher paid online trainers in the world um, in 20 months. Uh, my business has been launched for eight months um, and I am doing things 
uh, in the industry that not many people have accomplished as far as the growth of my business. And I also teach uh, organic Facebook strategy. So I have generated every single penny in my business um, without spending money on marketing. So that's kind of my kind of claim to fame or whatever. But business is amazing. I'm a very, very blessed individual. Uh, but a lot of that is because my clients lose an average of 30 pounds of fat in age 12 weeks again and again. And uh, the fat whisper. Uh, so they, uh, they, I'm, I'm the last resort. When, when they couldn't help, when they couldn't get help from any other weight loss program solution, I come in, I'm the specialist, and we get them down the weight they want to get down. Yeah, you have a program called TyFit, and I went through your program. It was, I lost a ton of weight. I felt fantastic when I was doing it. And it's a great, it's a, a nice, tight little eight week program and teaches you all the basic principles of fat burning. You're even called like, the fat whisperer. <laughs> <laughs> the fat whisperer. I know. I'm giving myself new nicknames like every day. So. Yeah, and it's great. And you give a lot of inspiration and, uh, you know, and basically teach people how to break their negative food associations. So that's what I wanted to talk about today on the show. Why don't you talk about what exactly are food associations? All right. So we all have associations, um, which, you know, are emotional connections um, to the things that we do in life. So based on events and things that happen when we're, when we're a child or things that happen throughout our life, and as these beliefs and associations are created, uh, if we don't stop to ask questions, a lot of times they just dictate how we operate through life. So I'm really under the impression, and you know, sure, the American diet is terrible, Wendy. Um, there's fast food joints on every corner, and that has a huge part to do um, with obesity and the health of America. But I would love you to consider for one second uh, that is the way we are going about raising our children that is creating um, this dysfunction around food. So you're five years old and you scrape your knee on the, uh, the sidewalk playing with your friends and you come in and you got tears in your eyes. You're like, mom, you know, I, I hurt my knee and it sucks and all this. And she looks at you and she's like, it's okay, honey, let's go get you an ice cream and it'll make it all better. Mm -hmm. Right then and there creates the association and the belief that food will cover up emotional pain, which couldn't be more bullshit. It couldn't be further from the truth. But this is the belief that's created and instilled in us from a young child. Now, think about when you go to the doctor and you get a shot. What do they give you? They give you a piece of candy. They give you a sucker. So it, we're, we're constantly told that we get to be rewarded by putting sugar in the body or negative food that creates disease and dysfunction when, when we go through some sort of a you know, traumatic pain or, or you know, anything. And then also, as we raise our kids in today's society, we use food and treats and candy as rewards. You got an A on your paper. Here's the candy. Um, it's your birthday. Let's go get you something. Let's go get you a cake. And right here, it's not, it's okay to be rewarded. But what this is doing, Wendy, is it's creating beliefs and associations in children that food is comfort, that food will take away emotional pain, that food is the solution to a problem, which couldn't be further from the truth. We grow up and we become adults. And now we, we do understand the truth that sure, a, you know, a, a ice cream is not going to help. Um, a cut. It, in fact, it's got no nutrition portfolio at all, and it actually doesn't help the body heal in any kind of form or fashion. But we don't. We go through the motions, and these beliefs and associations have already been created. So, without thinking about it, right? Without even thinking about it, when we're stressed out or we come across um, a tough situation, we automatically turn to food because it's just second nature. And so. Most people aren't even aware that they have these food associations. Uh, a lot of people have heard emotional eating. A lot of people do. So the, what can happen once these food associations are created um, is we can continue to sabotage with food and actually move further away from our goals. And the example that I like to use is uh, you're, you're a girl and, and you, your boyfriend comes over one night and says, honey, it's just not going to work anymore. And the boy, the boyfriend dumps the girlfriend. So the girl gets all depressed, and she gets all sad, and she turns to the pint of Ben and Jerry's in the uh, in the freezer, right? Like just classic story, you know. Oh, girl broke up with her boyfriend. Let's shove some food down her face. Well, let's look at this from a conscious standpoint. What does she really want? She wants to feel confident. She wants to be loved. Um, what is she currently going through? 
well, she's probably feeling unworthy. Uh, she maybe feel unconfident, um, feels like she's not good enough. Uh, regardless if this is the truth or not, those are the feelings that is created. So what she really wants is to, is to lose a few pounds. She wants more confident in her skin. She wants to look better. But because the associations are so embedded in her subconscious mind, she goes for the ice cream without even thinking about it. Now, when we, we step away and we, we detach emotion and we actually look at this, so she, you're telling me she wants to lose weight, she wants to be more confident, and she wants these things, but then she's going for ice cream, which is actually taking her the complete opposite way of what she wants to create. So a lot of this is just asking questions about what we're trying to search, but she's using food to fill up on a feeling. And so she's using food to fill up on a feeling. And... Uh, she doesn't even uh, think about it. Real quick before we move on, one more example is I had a lady come to me and she had gained a ton of weight in the last year and she had always been healthy, fit up until this point. Um, come to find out she was drinking a bottle of wine, eating a half a pound of chocolate and popcorn every night. Uh, and as I got to know this client and got to know her better and better, um, Turns, turns out that her mother did pass away a year ago, and when I found this out, I said, you know, by chance, did you and your mother used to get together once in a while and drink wine and eat gourmet chocolate and popcorn? And she's like, oh, my God. Oh, she could, I mean, it just hit her, like a ton of bricks right there. So she was actually trying to recreate connection with her mother, mm -hmm. and she was shoving bullshit down her throat to do it and she wasn't even aware once she became aware we actually looked at the truth well is eating this stuff actually going to bring your mother closer to you is it going to bring her back is it going to increase the connection no it's not mm -hmm. you're actually just going further away from actually what you want to create so these emotions are embedded in our subconscious and we're unaware that they're even there yeah yeah i had a similar experience when i was with my ex-husband uh, I was uh, very unhappy in the relationship the last couple of years, and I found out I was eating a, a huge chocolate bar every single night just to kind of, just to feel better. I mean, I literally ate a gigantic brick of chocolate bar, and it was really not in line with my being a health coach and trying to coach people to get healthier. Um, but I felt better when I ate that, and the listeners might, may have also uh, noticed I've lost, uh, you know, 20 pounds um, since I, you know, stopped that, that terrible habit. And and it just came hmm. from, you know, uh, you know, recreating my life in a way that's more positive and I don't need that that chocolate crutch anymore, so to speak. I was able to break that that's negative awesome. food association. Yeah. Well the truth is, Wendy, is the chocolate actually is it, it may create uh, you know, a quick feeling of, of better, but it's a band aid solution and food doesn't really make you feel better. Mm -hmm. Um it, it doesn't it doesn't create the feeling we're looking for and for that reason when we're done we usually look and we're like oh man you know like we know that we, we we just screwed up and then we feel more guilty we bring on more shame and we are who, how we perceive ourselves to be so we'll go into that in a little bit in the conversation victimizing ourselves so now when I screw up or when I eat something I shouldn't instead of being like dude you shouldn't have done that what are you doing I simply hug myself um, I give myself a little love and I say dude it's all right uh, you're, you're amazing and, and you'll, you'll get it next time. Yeah. Yeah. I don't beat myself as much either. It's very easy to fall in that trap of like self-loathing and, and not, you know, beating yourself up because you're, you're failing, so to speak, when you're trying to do a diet or <clears throat> skip sugar or what have you. But you do, you just have to pick yourself up and get right back on that horse again the next day. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's talk about, you yeah, know, absolutely. Uh, why do you feel that food associations play a major part in obesity and overeating? Okay, so based on the way that we're raising our kids is we're basically teaching all of our, like, and I've already covered a little bit of this, but we're basically teaching our children that food is a way to cover up emotional pain because any, or it's like, you know, you get parents where their kids are crying and they just want them to shut up and they're like, here's a candy, you know, like, here. Here you go. Here, here's a sucker or whatever. So what is happening is that, like I said, they grow up and, and then they have eating problems. Uh, other eating disorders are created based on the way that parents taught them about food. Now, I understand that a lot of parents don't, but we got to stop rewarding our children with food. 
We, we've got to stop rewarding our children with food. This starts with us. It starts with the parents. And we've got to stop rewarding our children with food because we're, we're setting them up for major, major failure. And like every client that I've ever had and taken them through this process, I mean, it just blows their mind. And this is the same way that I've helped drug addicts recover is finding out what they're actually trying to fill up on. And so the kids will assume that, you know, by eating this food that made them feel better when they were a little kid, that it'll cover up the emotional pain and it won't. And so this is why people get 80% of the way to their goal and then they sabotage. This is why people lose weight and gain weight because they don't actually break the food associations or change the belief and change the association to create what they want. And so it, uh, it is absolutely playing a part in obesity. Now, there's the food supply is terrible. We're in a fast food nation. Those things play an important part too. Um, but every single client that I've ever worked with has some type of food association. And when we break those food associations, they're aware that it doesn't actually fix the emotional problem. And it really is as simple as that. Once we break the food associations, um, the biggest thing I hear from my clients is, I don't and will never look at food the same way um, after your course. And that's what we're really trying to instill. Because when we change the way that we think, Wendy, we change our results. You can go on a million different diets and you can lose the weight and gain it back. But if you don't fix the reason that you were overweight in the first place, the psychological, emotional reason, you're not going to have long-term success. Yeah. And so how and why are these, uh, these food associations created? So, yeah. You know, we, we've kind of gone into that, so I it can go forever, but yeah, how and why they're created, um, any association. So, for instance, I, and I'll get a little personal with you guys, um, I, for years, showed up in a mask, and I was so afraid to be me in front of anybody, and I know that's hard to believe now, right? Uh, yeah, so, but I was so afraid to be me in front of anybody, um, and so I dug back into my past to figure out why this was. And uh, when I was seven years old, my father came home from the bar and he was drinking. He was very upset. And him and my mother started fighting and he actually stuck a gun in his mouth. And I took off and I ran out the back the back porch and I jumped over the fence and I ran two miles. By the way, you guys, my dad is alive. We have a beautiful relationship today. Um, but, you know, I ran off and I took and I hid behind a dumpster, Wendy. And I remember sitting there and thinking, I must not be good enough. I must not be a uh, good enough son. And that's where I started to create the belief that I couldn't show up as who I was. And that was because if I did that, I was going to hurt others. And that's when I created the belief that I had to show up a specific way to seek approval and love from other people that I wasn't good enough by myself. Mm -hmm. So it was just that one incident. But then it shaped the belief and the belief continues to our belief system proves this right so we see what we want to see so if we have a certain belief we will always see that in our life it isn't it isn't actually until we change the belief that things start to change so when I realized that that was the the, the cause the root cause of the belief that had created me wanting to show up in a mask and so afraid to be me I broke that I I took away emotional attachment. I found it untrue. Well, was it really, because is it really the truth that I wasn't good enough and that's why my father, no, he was stuck in his own shit. You know, he was, you know, in a bad marriage. I had nothing to do with his son, but I took that on my shoulders. Yeah. And so in the same way, these food associations are created from experiences and then we continue to use food to cover up pain again and again and again it becomes habitual and then pretty soon we're doing this without even realizing what we're doing so it's just like somebody who it would have this association they get stressed out and they would you know, be on like, and I've have clients that do. They'll be on a diet and they'll go in and grab a piece of cheesecake and like halfway through the first fight, they're like, "What am I even doing?" Like somebody said the other day, you know, I just went to the vending machine, got a soda pop, and I took one sip, and I finally like was like, "What am I?" So people are literally go through the motions like in robots, right? Like not even asking questions or becoming aware, and and they're just basically dictated to by their beliefs and associations. So that's how they're created. Um, and they're created based on a lot of how we are raised, um, you know, and so this really what, what I want to do is I want to get the message out there to you parents that you are setting your kids up for failure 
if you are rewarding them with food. Mm -hmm. If you are telling them that food is a way, you're going to have a fat children. So how are food associations changed or broken? Well, to break a belief or to break an association, we got to find the root cause of it. Um, and so, yeah, we got to find the root cause. So we get to go back in the past a lot of times um, and asking questions is also huge. So this is basically food consciousness and to become a conscious individual, you want to ask questions. I often use the example of my nephew. I tell people to ask children or ask questions questions like a child. I remember my nephew was like three and he's like, what color is that? I'm like blue. He's like, why? That's what they painted it. Why? That's the paint he had in the truck. Why? Like, and it's just like so curious, right? But when we get older, Wendy, we stop asking questions and we just take it for what it is. And that couldn't be, um, it's just so, it's not beneficial. We got to ask questions. We want to continue to learn, to grow and evolve. And if we stop asking questions, we stop learning, we stop growing, we stop evolving. So we have a food association that's created. And like, for instance, I was talking about the lady who lost or gained 60 pounds in a year. Once we figured out why she was eating the food and we actually learned the truth of, well, is that actually connecting you with your mother? Is it bringing you closer to her? Well, no. Well, now we can break that. So there's a couple of tips and, and things I can give the, the listeners now to bro break food associations. So let's say that you're stressed out and you're a stress eater and you're stressed out and then you're going through the motions. You're not asking yourself the questions and you reach for uh, the chocolate. We'll just go the chocolate in the fridge and you're pulling it up to your mouth and you're, you're about to eat it. Well, you never even thought for a second, and I guarantee you, why? what am I trying to fill up on? What feeling am I trying to fill up on? Well, I notice that I'm stressed out right now. Huh, interesting that I would go for the chocolate. Is the chocolate actually going to create less stress in my life? Is the chocolate actually going to give me the feeling that I'm trying to fill up on? And the answer is no, and any sane, conscious individual can realize that. But if we don't ask ourselves these questions, we continue to go through the motions. And it's very interesting because the feeling that we're trying to fill up on is never actually, is, is never actually accomplished or given to us by the food. And so it's like, it's like God, we're, we're human beings. We're the smartest creatures on the planet, yet we make things so difficult on ourselves. And so... Let's say that you – we'll use the, the, the example of the children again. So let's say that you – you know, when, when things are, are tough in life or you're going through a crisis, uh, you turn to food or you, know, you break up with somebody, you turn to food. Well, I would ask a client, when is the very first time you can remember doing that? Mm -hmm. When is the very first time you can remember doing that? Well, like you know, I remember my mom. And she gave me this food and it made me feel better when I was this this young or this age. That is when I remember doing it. Some people it's cheeseburger. Some people it's ice cream. Some people it's candy. It's different for everybody. And that's, so was the truth though that the ice cream or, or the candy actually created less pain, actually filled the emotion, emotional void that you were looking for, uh, cured the stress, and made the day better. Sure, you're a kid. It puts a smile on your face, but we can all see that that isn't the true reality. And so once we find where the associate, but remember, beliefs and associations are create, created. Once that belief is created, it continues to prove itself true in our lives again and again and again. We honestly do not see what we don't want to see or what we are unaware of. The example I will use is you go to the car dealership, you buy a new car um, and you're thinking, this car is badass. This is awesome. I've never even seen this car on the road. I can't wait to get this car. You get in it and you pull out of the parking lot, you drive 10 minutes home, you see it six times. Mm -hmm. Everybody's been in that situation where you get a new car and then you see it all over the road because now you're aware of it. We see what we are aware of. We dic Our perceptions dictate our actual reality. And so if that belief is created that food will cover up emotional pain, then you're going to get in situations where you're going to create that emotional pain and you're going to use food and it's going to make you feel better for a moment, but it's ultimately taking you further away from where you want to be. And uh, we can go into why you know sugar is bad for stress and all kinds of stuff. But really this interview in, in the, the concept that I'm teaching is food associations. So ask yourself a question, right? Let me write this note down. So yeah, 
why, what am I trying to fill up on? What feeling am I trying to fill up on? And then ask yourself if what you're going to do with the food is actually going to create that feeling. So it's as easy as like, oh, no, it's not. Okay, well, how do I create the feeling that I want to fill up on? So if you're the girl that her boyfriend left her, so she wants to feel more confident, she wants to feel loved, she wants to lose 10 pounds, well, the ice cream is going to take her further away, but if she asks herself how she's actually feeling, what she wants to create, and what she wants to fill up on, then she can go to the gym, or then she can talk to a friend, or she can actually create the feeling. So the, the saddest part is that we're using things to create these feelings that aren't actually creating the feeling. So it's a vicious cycle again and again and again. And this is um, a huge, huge issue. So you guys can go on all the diets that you want. Um, you guys can go on all the weight loss programs and you may do well for a little bit. Uh, but if you do not break these food associations, you will go back to your old patterns and your old habits to, to change the results you have. You have to change the way you think. This is without a doubt the most important concept I teach um, because it is what delivers long-lasting sustainable results in my clients um, and we got to break associations so same thing with drug addicts they got to break the association same thing with any habit mm -hmm. yeah one of the most profound books for me that I read about changing food associations was David Kessler's The End of Overeating uh, mm. one of the absolute best right. books yeah. that I've read on that and um, he talks a lot about different strategies that you can employ to break your when you're on automatic pilot and you're just driving like even when you're uh, driving down a road home from work and it's just lined with fast food places time to take a different route because you get these reward cues yes. these cues in your environment um, that you're just kind of on automatic pilot you see the cue you have a thought, I, I want to eat that, I feel like snacking, I want to have a little party in my mouth. And then you go, and you're just on an automatic pilot. So you have to be aware of the, the cues in your environment pushing you to eat. And he has so many different strategies based on science. David, David, David Kessler, Kessler, what was the book called? David Kessler, The End of Overeating. Uh, nice. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna check that out. Yeah, and I, a lot of the principles I wrote about in a blog post uh, that listeners can look up called "Kick Your Cravings Butt," and ah. um, so I, it's, it's a really long. I'm very proud of it. I spent uh, like two weeks writing it, um, but a lot of tips and tricks there too about how to change your food associations and um, you know stop those cravings right in their tracks. And really, it's just about awareness. Yeah. You know, being aware and, and stopping that impulse control. Um, it's all about asking the right questions. Yeah, because that's it's the hardest thing to do is just stopping that impulse control to eat. Um, so let's talk about uh, what are some tips to help people change eating habits and overcome sugar and bread addictions? Okay, so they've proven that sugar is more addictive than cocaine. It does it hits the same center in the brain. Um, I'm not saying that it's as bad as cocaine. It's pretty damn bad. Um, but basically, more people are strung out on sugar. Um, than any other drug in the world, and it truly is addictive. I'm going to read you guys some things that will help you uh, right now. And so, in some notes I took, uh, sugar for one is an unsustainable. It's unsustainable energy. It's void of nutrition, you guys. There's no nutritional benefit at all. Um, it gives you a little sugar rush, but that's the only energy it delivers. Um, and it's also linked to decreased absorption of essential nutrients. So, the more bullshit sugar that you eat, the less your body's actually going to absorb the good food. That you're taking in so it's so counterproductive to any kind of result um, and then also um, too much leads to fatty liver just got off with a good friend of mine uh, the phone earlier today you know he was raised on fast food sugar he's got a fatty liver so if you have a fatty liver your liver will not metabolize fat it will store fat you have two options to metabolize fat or store fat you get a fatty liver you ain't burning fat you're storing mm -hmm. it yeah. So that's huge, and sugar will lead to a fatty liver. Um, I read a study the other day, Wendy. The average American drinks 57, get 57 gallons of soda a year. Oh, God. Jeez. It's so hard to imagine. That used to be me. I used to eat soda, diet soda, at every single meal, sometimes even breakfast. Horrible. It's, I'm ashamed to admit that, but it's I was a typical, Amer sad, a typical American diet. Yeah, um, sugar also leads to inflammation. Ins inflammation leads to disease and pain. Uh, so that is is no good. Sugar is cancer. Our food for cancer. Yeah, and it is. It, 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 
Cancer eats sugar. It th survives and thrives off sugar, you guys. Two in three people are expected to get cancer. Uh, in today's world, we can't prevent it, okay? Or we can prevent it. In today's world, we can't avoid it. So people want to avoid this cancer causing. There's so much of it in our system. The best thing to do is to protect your immune system so that you can prevent it because all cancer is is a single cell pathogen that bypasses the immune system and grows into a tumor. We're all exposed to cancer causing um, agents and chemicals and things like that. Those of us with good, good immune systems will prevent it. Um, you know, sugar, not fat, raises cholesterol. I think that's a big one for you guys. Uh, it's not fat. Fat's actually beneficial. You guys actually know that eating pure grass-fed butter, which is fat, lowers cholesterol. <laughs> like it lowers cholesterol. Like fat and cholesterol. Yeah. So we've been we've been uh, mis misinformed about a lot, but good thing is is we're learning more about the human body today than we've learned in the last you know freaking 50 years it's it's amazing time to be a health professional and uh, we're just learning so much more and we're actually able to help people so much more effectively so how to get off sugar I'm a big fan and belief in affirmations so wake up every day um, I don't crave sugar uh, I'm eating healthy I'm living in a perfect body of health positive affirmations are incredible I use them with all my clients um, so basically if you can convince yourself that you're going to be sugar free, then you will become sugar free. Couple really cool tips for actual sugar craving. So, if you're going to cut sugar, there's no way to avoid um, withdrawals or cravings, um, and they typically last 10 to 14 days. Okay, so you actually have to go completely off sugar for 10 to 14 days. And when you're doing this, please just remember it does get better because most of my clients are like, that's what I'm telling myself. But in the moment, it seems like it will be that. Way. No, you don't understand. My clients, you don't understand. I'm freaking hungry. And I'm like, no, no, that's you secreting hormones. But you're addicted to sugar and your body will crave it. So, what can we do to uh, cut down those cravings? Bee pollen is amazing. Uh, take three teaspoons of bee pollen every morning. Um, that is very good. My number one recommendation for sugar cravings, and this is amazing. I really just discovered this about four months ago. All my clients are using it with tons of success. Peppermint essential oil. Mm. So peppermint essential oil hits the same addiction response center in the brain that sugar does. Right, and so we just put a little drop of peppermint essential oil on our tongue, and our mouth just gets all pepperminty, and it's like, and it's like the sugar craving goes away. I mean, you can do that once every hour if, if the sugar cravings are that bad. But do remember also that they go away. A lot of people, they make it five, seven, eight days, and the cravings are just so bad, they basically cave and they're like, I can't live with this forever. I can't seriously fight this kind of addiction forever. Um, bread, same thing. Um, another good thing to know is sugar and bread makes you guys stupid. It slows down cognitive response. It makes you stupid. Nobody wants to eat something that makes them stupid. Yeah. <laughs> you know what's another good thing that reduces sugar cravings is uh, Gymneva, Gymnema Sylvester. Um, that is a, an amazing herb that really helps to reduce sugar cravings. Something that I've used before that really helped me. Yeah, uh, that's awesome. I just wrote that down. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, it's, uh, a really good one is by uh, Standard Process. That's a really nice one. It's all organic and food based. It's great. Nice. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about um, how to overcome bread addictions. Uh, there's a lot of people out there addicted to bread, eating bread every single day, thinking about bread, slathering butter on it and jelly and whatnot. So how do we overcome bread addictions? The same way. I mean, addiction is addiction. So you guys get to understand that I approach food addiction just like drug addiction. And I have worked with uh, heroin addicts. Before um, I've worked with you know severe severe drug addicts to help them break associations and and overcome it. You guys, mindset is huge. There, I, if you're asking Wendy, is there a, a different way that I would approach bread addiction versus sugar? No, yeah. um, it's it's all addiction is addiction is addiction. Um, creating new healthy habits, positive affirmations, mm -hmm. support system is huge. Uh, people that support what you're trying to accomplish, um, and then belief. So one of my favorite quotes in the world. Uh, is by Henry Ford and he says whether you think you can or you can't you're right yeah I would love that quote I love that quote that you said that to me one day and I felt very very inspired by that <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> you inspire me Wendy yeah and then I got right back on my tie fit program after that um, so um, I another thing I wanted to add was that when people are severely craving sugar and bread and other carbohydrates Many times they have a serotonin deficiency, 
and they need to have their neurotransmitters checked and they can balance those temporarily and that can really help them to overcome uh, sugar and carb addictions. Um, but yes. many times the reason people have low neurotransmitters is because they're not absorbing proteins in the gut. And I see this with almost every person that I work with, a, a, a vast majority, uh, people that have low energy levels, they're not able to have the energy to absorb proteins into their gut, amino acids. And those amino acids are the building blocks of neurotransmitters that will prevent sugar and bread cravings. So it's a whole vicious cycle. You you know, uh, I use my mineral power program to help people to regain their energy, regain, regain their protein absorption ability, and it solves a lot of different problems. But sometimes people need to balance their neurotransmitters in the meantime. Yeah. Yeah, and I completely agree with you. So we're actually finding that 95% of serotonin is created in the gut, not the brain. Yeah. So serotonin is cre happy gut, happy you. No, I'm dead serious, you guys. Like it, gut health is so important. We're finding out that this is more important than anything. I went through an extensive gut rehab um, for the first time about eight weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, like my girlfriend was so here. She's like, you just can't stop smiling. She's like, all you do is smile. I'm like, dude, I'm not happy. Like, seriously, my sister's like, oh, you're just so damn happy, Tyson. Like, I'm. That's what serotonin does. It creates happiness. Yeah. Um, it creates feel good feelings, and that's created in the gut. So uh, I'm sure that you can testify too that a lot of addiction uh, comes from metal toxicity. And when we can detox the metal out of our body, we can, you know, further. Uh, aid ourselves in recovering from whatever it may be but yes um, there's direct links to the gut and cravings as well and it's so funny because sugar and wheat are like the two worst things for your gut yeah oh absolutely it's, it's catch-22 <laughs> mm -hmm. the more sugar and bread you eat the more damages your gut and the more you crave it and turn it's a horrible cycle so let's talk about your program type it um, all right yeah you type it yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. I'm super happy with my results. I really enjoy your eight week program and, and it's developed around improving human growth hormone production. So you, can you tell us a little bit, uh, you know, about your program and exactly how you help people to burn fat on the program? Yeah. Well, to be honest, Wendy, like everything, everything is always evolving and expanding and growing. And the course is, is not it's it's very similar obviously to what you went through but it's much different now and mm -hmm. the clients get are getting better results the results keep getting better and better and better um, and it yeah there's a part of it that's re, you know centered around HGH production um, and that's so important because the more HGH that we can uh, naturally release the more we can burn fat the more we can pack muscle the more we can repair our body the mm -hmm. thicker our bone density the better elasticity we have in our skin we you know we reverse the aging process our you know thin our skin thickens our hair grows more um, it's you know it's amazing so it's like the fit hormone um, the more you have coursing through your body the better you feel and the more fit you are the only difference between a 16-year-old boy and a 36-year-old man is the amount of HGH coursing through their system. This is why at 30, your metabolism starts to slow because that's when we go through somapause, the first phase of aging, and HGH starts to decrease. So by doing these workouts, we can effectively um, skip the first phase of aging. I know that's probably very enticing to a lot of people. Um, so I teach a very specific workout that mimics human growth hormone injections. The same injections that celebrities have been getting for $1,800 to $3,600 a pop, about $15,000 a year. That's why Jennifer Aniston looks so young. And, and, you know, I mean, these guys have been getting HGH injections, which preserves age. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, that's a big part of it. But it's it's so much more than that. And so I don't like people when they refer to I'm not a trainer. I'm a coach. Um, and I teach higher consciousness as well. And I teach, uh, you know, getting away from self-sabotage. I and, and this is really expanded. So I'm taking clients strictly for personal development now. Um, and then I'm taking some just for the type fit and some come to get both. So most people tell me, hey, I came to you for fitness. But what I walked away with it was invaluable. It, it's so much more. And that's remarkable. I keep getting housewarming gifts from my clients. Like, it's awesome. Like, I have the best clients in the world. Like, all of you guys, like, if you watch this interview, I fucking love you. You guys are amazing. Um, every, your, your client, I love you too. Um, but anyways, yeah, human growth hormone. So we focus on human growth hormone. We focus on, you know, so that's the exercise part, uh, the diet part. And what I want to tell you guys also is – the, the biggest result that I've seen since Thai Fit launched was 65 pounds of fat lost in 10 weeks. Mm. That's remarkable. 65 wow. pounds of fat was, was the largest result that I ever saw. Guy did three 20-minute workouts a week. 
Wow. Three 20 minute workouts a week. So more is not better. Um, when we actually do things like CrossFit and, and lift weights all the time, we're actually dumping a stress hormone called cortisol into the system. That's slowing down our immune system. Typically, when my clients are, you know, the weight loss plateaus, I'll have them do half as much and they'll lose twice as much. It's really, really beneficial. Um, then we teach the diet aspect. I teach a lot of mindset techniques. Um, and then positive affirmations, belief, um, a ton of assignments that help people understand why they're doing what they're doing. So we are expanding right now and I'm trying to develop some lower end products so people can come just for the fitness, just for the personal development, both. Um, but I'm uh, you know, very, very blessed and happy with the program. Um, I truly believe, um, and I have no qualms saying this, that if I'm not already, I'm headed in the direction of being the best weight loss professional in the entire world. I've dedicated my life to research. Uh, that's part of my job. I research 15 to 20 hours a week, um, dissect material, finding the best ways to help my clients. And we just partnered with a new company, which I'm not going to talk too much about. Um, but I really believe that we're very, very close once we implement this to where the average result will be 50 plus pounds lost in 90 days. Wow. That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, I, I wish I'd gotten that result, but then there'd be nothing left of me. <laughs> uh, come back. But listen, I didn't have that but I didn't have that much to lose. So um mm -hmm. so I'm you I'm look great, but... really, really happy with my results. <laughs> so I have a question I like to ask all of my guests. What do you think is the most pressing health issue in the world today? Um so obesity leads to more disease um, because of the health, but I'm gonna say cancer. Mm -hmm. I, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. We all have been there, um, you know, to have a loved one or somebody that we're very close to, or maybe even somebody watching this who's, who's gone through cancer. Um, I'm here to tell you guys that with proper diet and nutrition, you can prevent it. You can. So, um, you know, everybody should be uh, working their butt off to prevent cancer. Uh, in today's world with all the exposure to it. So I won't go too much into it, but you can prevent it. Um, you know, a couple of cool things for the listeners to Google chaga mushroom, Google chaga in cancer, C-H-A-G-A -A is chaga mushroom. Um, Google phytoplankton in cancer. Um, goji berries, like there's a lot of things that you can take that kill, kill cancer cells. Um, so I would do some research on what does kill cancer cells and I would just do weekly maintenance and I would incorporate some of those things into your diet so that you guys aren't affected by this terrible, nasty disease. Yeah. Yeah. It is a grim reality today. You know, the statistics are very good chance that you will develop cancer at some point in your lifetime. And there are so many things in your control that you have to prevent it, but you have to be proactive. You can't wait until you get a diagnosis because once you get that diagnosis, that disease process has been in effect for five to 10 years. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. And you know, don't wait until you get a diagnosis. Start today to do something. And that's really my passion uh, with starting live to 110.com. When my father was diagnosed with esophageal cancer, um, unfortunately he passed away six months after his diagnosis. Uh, but that made me uh, really delve into the research on cancer and underlying causes. And that's why I exactly why I developed my mineral power program, because it's uh, really my personal mission is to to help people to prevent cancer and awesome. other, other types of diseases. But you, you have to put some time into it. You have to think about a daily detox regimen. And uh, that's why I created my whole site. So I completely yeah. agree with you. That's awesome. The last thing that I'll say is what's coming to type in. We're actually unveiling this in April is that I have, and I'm keeping it under wraps, but we partner with the company and we are going to be able to protect or not protect, but we are going to be able to predict oncoming disease, it, it, very specific as far as breast cancer, um, colon cancer, whatever type of cancer. Actually, we're able to predict 75 different types of diseases mm -hmm. with 80 to 93% accuracy. 10 years into the future hmm. and with 70 to 80 percent accuracy with 20 years into the future and we have the data to prove it over 15,000 assessments and hmm. so now I will actually be able to engineer diets and I'll be able to sell some but so like you said people wait till it's too late they wait till they're sick to do yeah. something 
well, what if I was to come to you and been like, based on this assessment, based on this blood work, you have a high likelihood to get cancer. So you've got like a 70% chance of you know, getting this type of cancer sometime in life. That would be enough information for somebody to do something about it before the actual problem is there. And that's what I'm truly excited about. My passion is weight loss, uh, but disease prevention is a close second. Yeah, yeah. Well, so wanting to the listeners where they can find you and learn more about Typhet. Okay, so you guys can go to www.theactionboss.com. You can download my two-week free sprint protocol, which mimics HGH injections. Um, I run, uh, and I'll give you the link, Wendy. I run an amazing fitness group on Facebook, and I just started running this group about three months ago. It's called Thai Fit Elite Fitness. And what's so great about I basically wanted to build a group that I could charge $50 a month for and give it to everybody for free. One of the big problems out there is misinformation. There's tons of information out there, you guys. I mean, we've got all kinds of it, right? Like, in everything contradicts another thing. 90% of it's garbage, and that's why you're not reaching your goals, because you're reading the wrong stuff. So mm -hmm. what I've done is I've gathered Wendy's in the group. Um, I've gathered hundreds of health professionals, hundreds of health enthusiasts, all kinds of people that do their research, that know legitimate information, and there is a ton of value posted in that group on a daily basis with the right things to reach your goals, whether it be preventing disease, getting healthier, more energy, weight loss, building muscle. You can guarantee, and, we, and I have admins that regulate this, as soon as we see bullshit in that group, we delete that post and delete the member. Yeah. So we do not allow anything in there. It's a place where you guys can be safe and get the truth. It's called Thai Fit Elite Fitness. Also, you can follow me on Facebook, Tyson James Lee. I'm the only one. Um, and then www.theactionboss.com. Um, I have a blog that we're uploading and updating now, blog.theactionboss.com. And those would be the best ways. You can follow me on Instagram at, at the action boss. At the action boss. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Tyson. It's always a joy to have you on the show. You have so much energy and, and you're a very good friend. I, I really appreciate all the help that you've given me. And I definitely encourage uh, any of the listeners who are trying to lose weight, you're struggling to lose weight, uh, Tyson can definitely give you that last piece of the puzzle to help you. Yeah, we got, we got a two-month waiting list right now. Though. Okay, okay, good. People well, are beating at the door. Yeah, well, hey, go get on that waiting list. I recommend yeah. it. And listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. You can find me at live2110.com and learn more about my healing and detox program, Mineral Power, at mineralpower.com. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you so much for coming on the show. What a delight to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, why don't you tell the listeners you know, a little bit about why you became a meditation teacher? So I have a bit of a weird journey from Broadway showgirl to meditation teacher, even though you can't tell it right now with my no makeup and wet hair, but I used to be very fancy back in my day. <laughs> um, but I was basically living my dream, like doing the thing I had wanted to do since I was eight years old and miserable. Uh, I think that when I was a little girl, I thought that once I got on Broadway, my whole life was going to be sunshine and roses, and instead it was girls eating tuna fish out of their can and, and like complaining about their bunions and I was like wait this is not my dream and uh, it was very confusing to me why I was doing the thing I had always wanted to do but um, pretty miserable because I was um, I was understudying three of the lead roles which basically means that you show up to the theater and have no idea who you're going on for um, sometimes they would switch me from one character to the other I would just be chilling in my dressing room doing my taxes and they would say Emily Fletcher to the stage and I would start panicking, grab three costumes, run down seven flights of stairs, and sometimes be on stage before I knew which role I was playing. Um, some people are very good at that. I'm not one of them. Uh, I didn't love that constant anxiety of not knowing what was going to happen. And it, it started to wear on my body. I started going gray at 26. I started having insomnia for about 18 months. I couldn't sleep through the night. And I started getting injured quite a bit. And after a while, I just didn't feel like myself. I didn't feel like the version of me that moved to New York City believing that I could do whatever I wanted to do. So thankfully, this girl sitting next to me in the dressing room had a harder job than I did. She was understudying five of the leads, and this woman was rocking it. I mean, every song she did, she sang was a celebration, and every dance she did was a celebration, and every bite of food, like literally every bite of food seemed like a celebration. I was like, girl, what do you know that I don't know? And she said, I meditate. 
And I was like, come on, you know, because this is almost 10 years ago and people weren't really talking about it then like they are now. And I was like, how can that, how can you sitting quietly in a chair wasting your time help with this level of stress and anxiety? Yeah. And she was like, no, it helps my concentration, my performance anxiety, my, my immune function. So I didn't believe her, so I just kept being miserable and going great and having insomnia. And then finally I felt so embarrassed about my performance that I had to try something. So I went along with this intro to meditation talk, liked what I heard, signed up for this four-day course. And on the first day of the first course, I was meditating, uh, which I had no idea really what that meant, but I was in a different state of consciousness than I had ever been before, and I liked it. And then that night I slept through the night for the first time in 18 months. Wow. Yeah. And I have every night since, and that was almost 10 years ago. Then I stopped getting sick, stopped getting injured, started enjoying my job again, and then actually stopped going great.